Chapter 2 Scarlet's feelings came in colors even brighter than usual. The urgent red of burning coals, the eager green of new grass buds, the frenzied yellow of a flapping bird's feathers. He'd finally written back. She read the letter again, then again and again. Her eyes took in each sharp stroke of ink, every waxy curve of the caraval master's silver crest. A sun with a star inside, and a teardrop inside of the star. The same seal was watermarked onto the enclosed slips of paper. This was no prank. Donatella! Scarlet plunged down the steps into the barrel room in search of her younger sister. The familiar sense of molasses and oak snaked up her nose, but her scandal of a sibling was nowhere to be found. Tella, where are you? Oil lamps cast an amber glow over bottles of rum and several freshly filled wooden barrels. Scarlet heard a moan as she moved past, and she caught bits of heavy breathing as well. After her latest battle with their father, Tella had probably drunk too much and now deuced somewhere on the floor. Donna! She choked on the last half of her sister's name. Hello, Scar. Tella flashed Scarlet a sloppy grin, all white teeth and swollen lips. Her honey blonde curls were a mess as well, and her shawl had fallen to the floor. But it was the sight of the young sailor with his hands wrapped around Tella's waist that made Scarlet stutter. Did I interrupt something? Nothing we can start up again. The sailor spoke with a lilting Southern Empire accent, far smoother sounding than the sharp Meridian Empire tongues Scarlet was accustomed to. Tella giggled, but at least she had the grace to blush a little. Scar, you know Julian, right? Lovely seeing you, Scarlet. Julian smiled, as cool and seductive as a slice of shade in the hot season. Scarlet knew the polite response would be something along the lines of, Good to see you too, but all she could think about were his hands, still coiled around Tella's periwinkle skirts, playing with the tassels on her bustle. As if she were a parcel, he couldn't wait to unwrap. Julian had only been on the Isle of Trista about a month. When he'd swaggered off his ship, tall and handsome, with golden brown skin, he'd drawn almost every woman's eyes. Even Scarlet's head had turned briefly, but she'd known better than to look any longer. Tella, mind if I pull you away for a moment? Scarlet managed to nod politely at Julian, but the instant they'd woven through enough barrels to be out of his hearing, she said, What are you doing? Scar, you're getting married. I would think you'd be aware of what occurs between a man and a woman. Tella nudged her sister's shoulder playfully. That's not what I'm talking about. You know what will happen if father catches you. Which is why I don't plan on getting caught. Please be serious, Scarlet said. I am being serious. If father catches us, I'll just find a way to blame it on you. Tella gave a tart smile. But I don't think you came down here to talk about that. Her eyes dropped to her leather in Scarlet's hands. The hazy glow of a lantern caught the metallic edges of the paper, making them blaze a shimmery gold, the color of magic and wishes and promises of things to come. The address on the envelope lit up with equal luster. Mrs. Scarlet Dragna, care of the Priest's Confessional, Trista, Conquer Dials of the Meridian Empire. Tella's eyes sharpened as she took in the radiant script. Scarlet's sister had always liked beautiful things, like the young man still waiting for her behind the barrels. Often, if a Scarlet lost one of her prettier possessions, she could find it tucked away in her younger sister's room. But Tella didn't reach out to take this note. Her hands remained at her sides, as if she wanted nothing to do with it. Is this another letter from the Count? She spat out the title as if he were the devil. 
Scarlett considered defending her fiancé, but her sister had already clearly expressed her thoughts on Scarlett's engagement. It made no difference that arranged marriages were very much in fashion throughout the rest of the Meridian Empire, or that for months the Count had faithfully sent Scarlett the kindest letters. Tella refused to understand how Scarlett could marry someone she'd never met in person. But wedding a man she'd never seen frightened Scarlett far less than the thought of staying on Trista. Well, Tella pressed, are you going to tell me what it is then? It's not from the Count. Scarlett spoke quietly, not wanting Tella's sailor friend to overhear. It's from the Master of Caraval. He wrote you back? Tella snatched the note. God's teeth! Shh! Scarlet pushed her sister back toward the barrels. Someone might hear you. Am I not allowed to celebrate now? Tella retrieved the three slips of paper hidden within the invite. Lamplight caught their water seals. For a moment, they glowed gold, like the edges of the leather before shifting to a dangerous shade of bloody crimson. Did you see that? Tella gasped as swirls of silver letters materialized across the page, slowly dancing into words. Admit one, Donatella Dragna of the Conquered Isles. Scarlet's name appeared on the other. The third only contained the words Admit one. Like the other invites, this was printed above the name of an isle she'd never heard of. Isla de los Sueños. Scarlet imagined this nameless invitation was meant for her fiancé, and for a moment she thought of how romantic it could be to experience Caraval with him once they were married. Oh look, there's more! Tella squealed as new lines of scripts appeared on the tickets. To be used once, to gain entrance into Caraval. Main gates close at midnight on the 13th day of the growing season, during the 57th year of the Atlantean dynasty. Anyone who arrives later than this will not be able to participate in the game or win this year's prize of one wish. That's only three days away, Scarlet said. The bright colors she'd felt before turning to her usual dull shades of gray disappointment. She should have known better than to think, even for a moment, that this could work out. Maybe if Caravor were in three months, or even three weeks, sometime after she was married. Scarlet's father had been secretive about the exact date of her wedding, but she knew it would not be in less than three days. Leaving before then would be impossible, and far too dangerous. But look at this year's prize, said Tella. A wish. I thought you didn't believe in wishes. And I thought you'd be happier about this, Tella said. You know people would kill to get their hands on these. Did you not see the part where he said we need to leave the isle? No matter how badly Scarlet longed to go to the caravel, she needed to get married even more. To make it in three days, we'd probably have to leave tomorrow. Why do you think I'm so excited? The glimmer in Tella's eyes grew brighter. When she was happy, the world turned shimmery, making Scarlet want to beam along with her and say yes to whatever her sister desired. But Scarlet had learned too well how treacherous it was to hope in something as elusive as a wish. Scarlet sharpened her voice, hating herself for being the one to crush her sister's joy. But better she than someone who would destroy even more than that. Were you also drinking rum down here? Have you forgotten what father did the last time we tried to leave Trista? Tella flinched. For a moment, she looked like the fragile girl she pretended so hard not to be. Then, just as quickly, her expression changed, pink lips curving once again, shifting from broken to unbreakable. That was two years ago. We are smarter now. We also have more to lose, Scarlet insisted. 
It was easier for Tella to brush aside what had happened when they'd attempted to go to Caraval before. Scarlet had never told her sister the entirety of what their father had done as retribution. She'd not wanted Tella to live in that much fear, to constantly look over her shoulder, to know there were worse things than their father's standard forms of punishment. Don't tell me this is because you're afraid it will interfere with your wedding. Tella gripped the tickets tighter. Stop, Scarlet grabbed them back. You're going to crinkle their edges. And you're avoiding my question, Scarlet. Is this about your wedding? Of course not. It's about not being able to get off the island tomorrow. We don't even know where this other place is. I've never heard of Isla de los Duenos. But I know it's not one of the conquered isles. I know where it is. Julian stepped out from behind several rum barrels, flashing a smile that said he'd make no apologies for listening in on a private conversation. This doesn't concern you. Scarlet waved him away with her hand. Julian looked at her strangely, as if a girl had never dismissed him. I'm only trying to help. You've never heard of this isle because it's not part of the Meridian Empire. It's not ruled by any of the five empires. Isla de los Sueños is Legend's private isle, only about two days' journey. And if you want to go there, I can smuggle you onto my ship for a price. Julian eyed the third ticket. Thick lashes lined his light brown eyes just made for convincing girls to lift their skirts and open their arms. Tella's words about people who'd killed for the tickets echoed in Scarlet's mind. Julian might have had a charming face, but he also had that Southern Empire accent, and everyone knew the Southern Empire was a lawless place. No, Scarlet said, it's too dangerous if you get caught. Everything we do is dangerous. We'll be in trouble if we get caught down here with a boy, Tella said. Julian looked offended at being referred to as a boy, but Tella went on before he could argue. Nothing we do is safe, but this is worth the risk. You've waited your whole life for this, wished on every fallen star, prayed as every ship came into port that it would be that magical one carrying the mysterious caravel performers. You want this even more than I do. Whatever you've heard about caravel, it doesn't compare to the reality. It's more than just a game or a performance. It's the closest you'll ever find to magic in this world. Her grandmother's words played in the scarlet's head as she looked at the slips of paper in her hands. The caroler stories she adored as a young girl never felt more real than they did in that moment. Scarlet always saw flashes of color attached to her strongest emotions, and for an instant, goldenrod desire lit up inside her. Briefly, Scarlet let herself imagine what it would be like to go to Legend's private isle to play the game and win the wish. Freedom, choices, wonder, magic. A beautiful, ridiculous fantasy. And it was best to keep it that way. Wishes were about as real as unicorn. When she was younger, Scarlet had believed her Nana's stories about Carval's magic. But as she'd grown, she'd left those fairy tales behind. She'd never seen any proof that magic existed. Now it seemed far more likely that her Nana's tales were the exaggerations of an old woman. A part of a Scarlet still desperately wanted to experience the splendor of Caraval, but she knew better than to believe its magic would change her life. The only person capable of giving Scarlet or her sister a brand new life was Scarlet's fiancé the Count. Now that they were no longer held up to the lamplight, the script on the tickets had vanished, and they looked almost ordinary again. Tella, we can't. It's too risky. If we try to leave the isle, 
Scarlet broke off as the stairs to the barrel room creaked. The heavy treads of boots followed, at least three sets. Scarlet shot a panicked look at her sister. Tella cursed and quickly made a motion for Julian to hide. Don't disappear on my account. Governor Dragna finished his descent, the sharp odor of his heavily perfumed suit spoiling the pungent scent of the barrel room. Quickly, Scarlet shoved the letters into her dress pocket. Behind her father, three guards followed his every step. I don't believe we've met. Ignoring his daughters, Governor Dragna reached a gloved hand toward Julian. He wore his plum-colored gloves, the shade of dark bruises and power. But at least, he still had the gloves on. The picture of civility, Governor Dragna liked to dress impeccably, in a tailored black frock coat and a stripped purple waistcoat. He was in his mid-forties, but he'd not let his body turn to fat like other men. Keeping with the latest fashion, he kept his blonde hair tied back with a neat black bow, showing off his manicured eyebrows and dark blonde goatee. Julian was taller, yet the governor still managed to look down upon him. Scarlet could see her father appraising the sailor's patched brown coat and his loose breeches tucked into scuffed, knee-high boots. It said much about Julian's confidence that he didn't hesitate before offering the governor his own ungloved hand. Good to meet you, sir. Julian Marrero. Governor Marcelo Dragna. The men shook hands. Julian attempted to pull away, but the governor held on tight. Julian, you must not be from this isle. This time, Julian did hesitate. No, sir. I'm a sailor. First mate of El Beso Dorado. So you're only passing through? The governor smiled. We like sailors here. It helps our economy. People are willing to pay a lot to dock here. And they spend more money while they visit. Now tell me, what did you think of my rum? He waved his free hand around the barrel room. I imagine that's what you were down here tasting. When Julian didn't answer right away, the governor pressed harder. Was it not to your liking? No, sir. I, I mean, yes, sir, Julian corrected. Everything I've tried is very good. Including my daughters, Scarlet tensed. I can smell from your breath you weren't sipping any rum, said Governor Dragna. And I know you weren't down here playing cards or saying prayers. So tell me, which of my daughters are you tasting? Oh, no, no, sir. You have it wrong. Julian shook his head, eyes widening as if he would never do something so dishonorable. It was a scarlet, Tella broke in. I came down here and caught them in the act. No, Scarlet cursed her foolish sister. Father, she's lying. It was Tella, not me. I'm the one who caught them. Tella's face blazed red. Scarlet, don't lie. You'll only make this worse. I'm not lying. Father, it was Tella. Do you think I'd really do something like this? Weeks before my wedding? Father, don't listen to her. Tella interrupted. I heard her whispering about how she thought it would help with her nerves before the wedding. That's another lie. Enough! The governor turned to Julian, whose brown hand was still firmly grasped in his perfumed plum glove. My daughters have the bad habit of being dishonest, but I'm sure you'll be more forthcoming. Now, tell me, young man, which of my daughters were you down here with? I think there's been some sort of mistake. I don't make mistakes. Governor Dragna cut him off. I'll give you one more chance to tell me the truth, or... The governor's guards each took a step forward. Julian's eyes darted to Tella. With a sharp shake of her head, 
tell her mouth the name Scarlet. Scarlet tried to grab Julian's attention, tried to tell him he was making a mistake, but she could see the resolve in the sailor's face even before he answered. It was a Scarlet. Reckless boy. He no doubt believed he was doing Tella a favor when he was doing quite the opposite. The governor released Julian and removed his perfumed plum gloves. I warned you about this, he said to Scarlet. You know what happens when you disobey. Father, please, it was only a very brief kiss. Scarlet tried to step in front of Tella, but the guard pulled Scarlet back toward the barrels, grabbing her roughly by the elbows and yanking them behind her as she fought to protect her sister. For it wasn't Scarlet who would be punished for this crime. Every time Scarlet or his sister disobeyed, Governor Dragna did something awful to the other as punishment. On his right hand, the governor wore two large rings, a square amethyst and a sharply pointed purple diamond. He twisted both of these around his fingers, then he pulled his hand back and struck Tella across the face. Don't! I'm the one to blame! Scarlet screamed, a mistake she knew better than to make. Her father struck Tella once more. For lying, he said. The second blow was harder than the first knocking Tella to her knees as streams of red poured down her cheek. Satisfied, Governor Dragna stepped back. He wiped the blood from his hand on one of his guard's vests. Then he turned to Scarlet. Somehow he appeared taller than before, while Scarlet felt as if she had wilted in size. There was nothing her father could do that hurt her more than watching him hit her sister. Don't disappoint me again. I'm sorry, father. I made a foolish mistake. It was the truest thing she'd said all morning. She might not have been the one Julian had tasted, but once again, she had failed to protect her sister. I won't repeat it. I hope you mean that. The governor put his gloves back on, then reached into his frock coat and retrieved a folded leather. I probably shouldn't give this to you, but maybe it will remind you of everything you have to lose. Your wedding will be 10 days from today, at the end of next week, on the 20th. If anything gets in the way of it, more than your sister's face will bleed.